If I told you there exists a demon that pursues people who think they're brave and takes on the most terrifying form possible to scare them, would you go looking for it? Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where I'm trying to find the creepypasta discussed in this episode's first story. Today I've got tons of demonic encounters for you to make you want to take a bath in holy water. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also, look for Unexplained Encounters on Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you can leave us a review to help us reach more listeners. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Unexplained Creatures in the Middle East From Anonymous Mar Desma. It's a monster that feeds on one thing. Fear. I am very happy to say that I personally have had no encounters with it, but the stories that you might hear about it are usually told by people who are not liars. Allow me to explain what it is, first with some history. I live in Iran, specifically the province of eastern Azerbaijan. If you look up what is called the Iranian Plateau, or the Iranian Cultural Continent, or Greater Iran, you'll find Iran and a bunch of her neighboring countries. In this area, different branches of Iranian languages are spoken, and with similar cultures comes similar mythology, and with that comes shared monsters. Originally, we believed in monsters called Deves. They are creations of Ahriman, the devil. Deves are a mortal enemy to the human race, like demons in Western culture. Imagine ghouls with the strength to lift a mountain, with claws and teeth like daggers, and impenetrable skin. If that's not overpowered enough, they're also said to be very smart, capable of using black magic to do things like taking different forms. There are famous Deves, such as Cheshmuk, who is responsible for earthquakes and hurricanes. Some appear in Shah Nameh, the Book of Ancient Iranian Legends, such as the White Deev, who imprisoned the Shah of Iran and was defeated by a warrior from Sistan. After the Muslim conquest and conversion to Islam, people kept their culture, but the Deves were now called by an Islamic name, Jinn. Mar Desma is a Deev. Of course, that means some might call it Jinn. The word Mar Desma in Persian and other Iranian languages means man-tester, or man-challenger. It may be pronounced a bit differently in various parts. Mar Desma, Mart Asma, some might call it Javan Asma, meaning young tester or even jinn. But they all refer to the same thing, a div which can take different forms, even the forms of your loved ones. It can mimic the sounds of your loved ones and do anything it can to draw you into graveyards or forests or dark alleys and dark corners at night. When it takes the form of an animal or human, it looks completely natural. It feeds on fear and, oddly enough, never attacks timid people. It likes to scare brave souls. That's why it is called Challenger. Mar Dosma uses various ways and tactics. Sometimes it takes the forms of innocent-looking farm animals, such as sheep, goats, or dogs, and approaches lone people in the dark. Then it suddenly speaks or changes forms. Sometimes it might approach a lonely traveler or stranger. Sometimes you hear someone that you know calling you, trying to draw you into the woods or dark caves or something of the sort. If you go in, though, it will scare you to death. You might have a heart attack, so yeah, it can kill people. There are times it might appear as a thin and skinny looking creature, but as you want to investigate what it is exactly, it will start to rapidly grow taller and taller into a gigantic monster right from your nightmares. Maybe one night you're getting home late. A head comes out of a dark corner. Maybe the face looks like your neighbor, but as you want to say hello, the face begins to change the more you look, the uglier and scarier it becomes, until either you look away and run or continue watching the show 
and die of sheer terror. The Challenger always invents new ways to scare people, and usually it doesn't want to kill you, it just wants you to be scared. But there is one thing that will make it angry, so angry in fact, that it will not hesitate to tear you apart. Never tell Mar does Ma that you are not scared of it. Never challenge the Challenger. Some believe that if you become friends with a Mar does Ma, it can tell you the places of lost objects, or give you life advice or tell you something from the future. But I wouldn't risk it. My apologies for the long introduction. Just keep in mind that Mar does Ma only challenges the brave. So if you're a scaredy cat like me, there is no need to worry. Here are the stories. The first two I heard from people that I trust, and the last one is a famous story told around here, so take it with a grain of salt. Number 1. The Floating Man This story is from an old man in my village in eastern Azerbaijan, Iran. Our main product is apples. It happened in a trail around our village. During the day, it's gorgeous, but at night, it can be a very scary place. I will share the story from his point of view. I was younger, you see. Our watering schedule at the apple farm was set up so that each garden would have a few hours of water. My shift at the gardens began in the middle of the night, so I would have to wake up, pick up my shovel, then go to the gardens to water the apple trees. It was an hour-long walk, and it went right through the graveyard, then along through other people's gardens. I know what you're thinking, but no, it didn't happen in the graveyard. The night in question, I was able to pass through the graveyard without any trouble. I then entered the part of the path that was surrounded by trees. These trees formed a thick wall along the shoulders of the road. Here, all you can see are the stars above and the road lit by the moonlight below you. I soon arrived at the spot where there are some big rocks on the ground. I was looking down to watch my steps so that I didn't trip over one. It was then that I felt a presence above me. It was like I felt a shadow of fear lay over me. Hesitantly, I looked up. Between two of the trees, I saw this tall man floating above me. He had his hands completely open. Imagine someone floating in a pool with their front side and face in the water. And imagine you're under the water below them, sitting at the bottom, and they're staring right at you. That's what it was like. I was terrified when I saw his face. His eyes were big and wide open, almost popping out of their sockets. And his teeth. I wasn't sure if he was smiling or baring his teeth at me, or if he just didn't have lips at all but I knew those teeth did not look natural for a human. I whimpered, What are you? And it spoke to me. I am. But I didn't really want to stay there and hear what else it had to say. I quickly dropped my shovel and began to run with all the power I could summon in my legs. I'm not sure if it followed me or not, because I never did look back. I stopped only when I was back in the village on my doorstep. Even in the morning, I didn't dare go retrieve my shovel. I'm not sure what it was, and I was not going to stay there to hear the answer to my question. Number 2. The Sheep This story was told to me by a friend of mine. It happened to his great uncle in their village in Luristan. This story will be told from his point of view. I was in my twenties. One late, dark evening, I was on my way home, casually passing through the empty alleys when I saw this sheep at a small dead end. It was too late for sheep to be outside, unaccompanied and awake, so I thought it was a runaway. As I was watching it, I got a clearer look at it. It was a beautiful and healthy sheep, it looked to be a good breed, and I was very tempted to take it home myself. I was young and strong, so I just lifted it up and put it on my shoulders, and I kept walking. 
After a couple of steps, I remembered to check if it was a male or female. So I felt over between its legs. Now, as I'm just about to find out, the sheep brings its mouth closer to my left ear, and I hear it speak to me. You know, I am way older than your grandfather. Freaking out, I dropped the sheep, but when I looked back, it disappeared. It had just vanished like it was never there. When I arrived home, I told the story to my family, who said it was probably a djinn. Number 3. The Story of Palavan Abbas Palavan Abbas was a man in a small village named Tarmistan in Zagros Mountains. Palavan means champion because he was a wrestler, and Abbas was his name. Aside from wrestling, his main occupation was pottery. He had a student named Kasim who was going to learn his art. Kasim's father had passed away and he lived with his old mother. So Palavan Abbas had told Kasim that if there was any problem, he could ask him for help. One night, there was a knocking at Palavan's door. It was Kasim saying, Please hurry, Palavan. My mother is sick and I need your help to get her to a doctor. Now, Kasim seemed to be speaking with a different tone and accent than usual. But Palavan immediately got dressed and told Kasim to lead the way. After a while, it became clear that they were not on the right path to Kasim's house. Kasim was leading him outside of town. Kasim, where are we going? Asked Palavan. Kasim just turned and smiled at him with yellow teeth. Weird, he thought. They climbed a hill and Kasim said, We're here. So where's your mom, Kasim? As Kasim turned, Palavan saw that it wasn't Kasim at all. What he was now looking at was a hideous, three meter high creature with a humanoid body and the face of a dog. What are you? said Palavan. The creature replied, I am Mardasma. Are you scared? No. A champion fears nothing, replied Palavan. Well, then you must wrestle with me. If you lose, I will take your life, said the creature. And so they wrestled, fighting for hours. And near the morning, Palavan managed to win. As the monster's back touched the ground, it turned into dust and smoke. With many bruises and a lot of pain, Palavan went back to the village, to the real Kasim, where he told the others what had happened to him before dying from exhaustion. This is an update to the original set of stories about Mar Dasma. Since writing that previous post, I spoke to a distant cousin of mine who recalled an adventure we had as kids, something I had forgotten about. Although this is technically one story, I think it would be best to break it into two. Number four, behind the window. I was staying at my parents' house. They told me I could sleep in the room upstairs. That room was pretty big. It had a lot of stuff and junk in it, kind of like the old attics in movies. There was a window in there, maybe about two meters by two meters with thick curtains, and right under it was my bed. From the very start, I got a bad feeling about that window, but I just shrugged it off. At about 9 p.m., it started. Bang! It was like a muscular man had punched the glass as hard as he could. It was even more terrifying because I couldn't see outside. The curtains were too thick. Quickly, I ran downstairs in a panic, telling my grandmother, Oh, don't worry. We didn't hear anything. It probably was just some bird or bat attracted to the light of your room. Just turn the light off and go to bed, honey. So, I did. Around midnight, though, I was awakened by, you guessed it, another bang. 
This time, I was in the bed, so it was only inches from my face. I tried to calm myself down, to go back to sleep, but around 3 a.m. it came again, this time much harder. It felt as if something was hiding on the other side of that window, just about to break through and take me away. I couldn't see anything, and I was way too scared to open the curtain and peek outside. The pure silence was killing me now, not a single cricket or dog barking. Slowly, I crawled out of bed, quietly making my way downstairs to my grandparents. All the while, I felt hunted by something. Once I got down there, I just slept on a blanket on the floor. It wasn't comfy at all, but at least it felt safe. The following night, I tried once again to sleep in that very same room in the very same bed. But the large window with the thick curtains never did have that haunting feeling again. I would even go on to sleep there many times throughout the years, and I never had any more supposed bats or birds banging on the window. Nowadays, I think it may have been Mar Desma trying to scare me. I don't think bats would all of a sudden feel like going kamikaze on me like that. Number 5. The Brog This always gave me the goosebumps. Back when we were kids, Kay, my cousin, and I would play together, going on adventures, discovering things, and so on. One summer, we were entrusted with the responsibility to herd a dozen cattle. We would gather them in the morning, take them out into the fields, start a fire, and cook lunch as they ate. We would take them then to a river or somewhere with water to drink. Then we would take them back to the village in the evening. Now keep in mind, this happened in the exact same trail as the story, The Floating Man, that I told before. The night before, we had read a made-up story, a creepypasta, if you will, about a monster called Brog, who haunted a road in another country. I've forgotten which country that was. Now, we knew it wasn't real, and even if it was, it was in some other part of the world and could never get us. In this story, the Brog kind of looked like a werewolf. It was said that he would first feel hunted or stalked, then suddenly all the birds in the area would flee away. You would then begin to hear footsteps behind you, and they would get closer as if they are walking inches behind you. Then you would hear the breathing. Not long after that, you would hear a massive, terrifying roar. By the time you turned around to see your stalker, you would see nothing more than a pair of red eyes, and the following morning, they would find your cold, dead body. Your skin turned black as coal, and that was when we got too spooked to read the rest. The next morning, we decided to make our way through, you guessed it, the trail. In the morning, it was truly beautiful. As the evening approached, it took a bit longer than we liked to gather our things and the cows. In the dark, we were walking along the trail with the cows in front of us. Now, at the time, we had not heard the story of the floating man, so we weren't scared at all of the trail ahead. But that was about to change. One by one, the signs of Brog started to come to life for us. First, that sudden and ominous feeling of being stalked. Second, the birds all around the valley suddenly getting spooked all at once and flying away. Third, the footsteps getting closer and closer to us. We tried to walk, not run, faster and faster. Suddenly, the bushes behind us began to make noises, as if something was running through them and shaking them. I said to my cousin, Hey, why don't you take a look to see what's behind us? Dude, I I'm as scared as you are. I I'm not looking back, he said. We were sure that this was it that we wouldn't see the light of tomorrow. But as we made it to the graveyard, suddenly things changed, as if something heavy was lifted from our hearts. We found the courage to look back. What was following us was just a dog, and it just turned back and ran into the wilderness. 
Later that night, we decided to read the rest of the Brog story. A certain part made our hearts churn in our chest. Brog can show itself as a dog. All these years later, I would shrug off the Brog adventure as us being kids, but now I think that something knew exactly and specifically what we were scared of, then presented itself in that way. There are other stories about that trail. I once heard someone say they saw something that would be best described as a mix between Yoda from Star Wars and a monkey along that same trail at night. I found a big similarity in all of them. The graveyard is safe, and the Mar Dosma will not follow you there. My cousin believes that may be because there are good people buried there. Demonic Creature Encounter from Schaefer 9RX This did not happen to me. It happened to my younger brother a few years ago in 2020. To begin, I come from a very large family. My mother and a couple of my siblings have had very strange encounters with the paranormal, specifically a demonic presence. Personally, I have never had anything crazy happen to me. The odd things that have happened to me I can easily rationalize. It's important to note that my family and I are Christian. We believe the spiritual realm is real, and it sometimes allows itself to be seen by people at certain times. You may find this interesting, but I believe there is a difference between fallen angels and demons. Genesis 6 and the Book of Enoch give detailed and interesting depictions and origin stories beginning with when Satan fell from heaven and took a third of the angels with him, going on to create Nephilim through mankind. I believe demons are the spirits of the Nephilim because their souls are half angelic beings and half man. They must roam the earth until their appointed judgment from God. At times, demons can manifest themselves in many different ways, often for the purpose of influence. However, that is a whole other conversation and story of its own. Here is my brother's experience. This encounter took place across the street from where we live. My family and I live in the woods, way out in the country on the far outskirts of a small town in rural southwest Michigan. My brother used to do yard work and odd jobs for our neighbors across the street. One day in the late afternoon, my brother was doing some cleaning on our neighbor's pool. Our neighbor's pool is directly behind their house and it's surrounded by forest. Encompassing the pool except where it connects to the house is about a four to five foot embankment. My brother was diligently working when he noticed something very strange. It was the middle of the summer. The sun was setting and the forest was alive with birds, insects, and spring peepers, creating that beautiful summer melody. All of a sudden, everything abruptly went silent, like someone turned off a switch, shutting off all the noise. My brother said it fell so quiet that his ears began to ring. Being frightened by this sudden change in the atmosphere, he stopped working and began to look around, trying to make sense of it all. That's when he saw it. My brother turned and looked towards the far end of the pool, and standing on the other side of the embankment was this creature staring at him. My brother said it was not much more than 20 feet from him. Upon seeing this creature, my brother panicked so hard he fell backward to the ground. He began to crawl for cover. He then picked himself up and ran home as fast as he could and hid in his room. I recall arriving home shortly after the encounter. My mother told me, you need to check on your brother. He doesn't seem to be doing too well. I did as she said. I found my brother in his bed and I asked if he was okay. That's when he told me this story. He then described the creature he saw. He said the creature was dark gray in color and the most memorable attribute was its large piercing yellow eyes. My brother didn't get every detail of the creature because he didn't waste any time hightailing it out of there. He said the thing must have stood eight or nine feet tall because it was almost eye level with him despite it standing on the other side of the four foot embankment. My brother went on 
saying the facial features of it were animalistic, but also somehow resembled a man. The countenance of the thing can best be described as demonic. I believe my brother's encounter to be very real. His actions speak far louder than his words. When he told me this story, I could tell that his heart began to race, and he became visibly afraid. My brother is a very straightforward, no bullcrap kind of guy. He's also generally very skeptical, especially when it comes to the paranormal and when hearing about my mother and other siblings' experiences. For him to just tell a story like this, it goes way against his nature and character. My brother struggled to sleep after this encounter and suffered from severe nightmares, which would continue on for a few weeks. One night, my brother woke up out of a dead sleep in a panic. He had heard deep growling coming from his closet. I checked the closet for him, and of course there was nothing there. But I prayed over him, and I tried to comfort him as best I could. The day after the encounter, my brother acted very paranoid. He went back to the neighbor's house with a rifle, grabbed his tools, and never worked over there again. I don't know why my brother encountered this being, but after his experience, we had some horrible family tragedies take place. My brother told me his beliefs and perception of reality have forever been changed due to this experience. Watchers in the Park from Up North Goon This happened about 10 years ago in my hometown in northern Michigan. It stands as one of my few unexplainable encounters in life. I grew up in a small town, spent time in the Upper Peninsula my whole childhood, and I am very familiar with many of the ghost stories in Michigan. But it never occurred to me that I would ever experience anything significant in my life. You see, I didn't really believe in ghosts, but I did enjoy the stories. I had few friends as I was a weird kid, so the few I had were very special to me. My childhood best friend, Jay, moved to my town in first grade, and we quickly made off as good friends. We played on the playground together, messed around in class to annoy the teacher together. We were basically inseparable. Fast forward to the end of fourth grade, Jay's family moved to Kansas, which naturally upset me but he would come to visit his grandparents who lived in town every summer after that. The summer of my seventh grade year, he would continue to come visit his grandparents. He did the very same that summer. So, come June, I went to visit for the first week of my summer vacation. His grandparents lived on the south end of town, a block behind the only other traffic light we had. Just across the road from them was the town park, and next to that, of course, was the cemetery. The park was decent-sized with a long driveway and decent-sized dirt parking lot. At the back edge of the lot, there's a hill that leads down to the two baseball diamonds, and to the right of the lot was the play area and public bathrooms. A chain-link fence separated the park from the cemetery. There were only two lights on at the park at night, one at the bathrooms and one in the parking lot. On the first night staying at Jay's grandparents, it was like any other summer. We were very excited to see each other. Dinner was on the stove, dessert in the oven. We were just enjoying our evening. Usually, we liked to play in the park, set up baseball games, mess around in the woods directly behind the fields. At night, we would go over to the playground side and tell ghost stories, since after the air cooled down at night, a thick fog would roll off the cemetery and make things creepy. It really set the stage for these stories. That night would be no different. Around 1 a.m., we set out for the park. As usual, the fog started rolling over the playground, and it was rather quiet, and it was a bit chilly heading into the park. Me, Jay, and his older brother, E., got halfway down the driveway when E noticed his older sisters on the back end of the baseball fields. He said, Hey, let's go scare the girls. He started to walk over that way, 
but then we saw him stop dead in his tracks. He glanced over into the tall grass field next to the driveway. I stopped too, watching E. His face went pale, as if he had just seen a ghost. That worried me. E did not scare easily. When I followed his gaze, I saw what he was looking at, and apparently so did Jay. By then, all of us had frozen in fear. In the middle of the field, standing about seven feet tall, were these three shadowy figures. Looking closer at them, I noticed they weren't simply shadowy, they were just big shadows. They stood in the field, looking at J and D's sisters and their friends. They appeared to be wearing long trench coats with brimmed hats, but they were darker than the night itself. E snapped out of the daze and shakily said, Hey, what are you doing here? They didn't answer, of course, so he spoke louder. Hey, what are you doing? At this point, I was terrified, and after E had yelled that last time, those three figures turned their attention to us. Whatever in the world they were, they definitely weren't human, and they did not look nice either. When they turned, it was the most unnatural looking thing I'd ever seen, and their eyes looked straight through our souls. Beady small yellow dots on an otherwise blank face. E screamed as loud as he could at his sisters to run, then turned, grabbing me and Jay. Together, we sprinted back to the house, hiding in the living room the rest of the night, not sleeping at all. Once the sun came up, we decided we'd go over to the park and check the field for footprints or any clues as to what we saw the night before. Once we were over there, we found large, flattened spots in the grass, but no tracks leading out to it. The spot was just big enough to hold those three figures. To this day, I have no good explanation for it all. That park isn't even known to be haunted. But I've never been back there at night ever since. Warning. The following story contains violence against pets. Something killed my dogs. From Gray. I share these stories as I've gotten over the terror they've given me. I'm sure they can give you a nice scare. My first story starts with a warning. Please be careful who your family dates. My older brother used to date a woman who had warned that her family was cursed. I didn't really care what she said, but strange things began to happen when she moved in with us. My cousin and I used to play outside after dark with my little brothers, playing hide and seek. I would soon start getting these creepy feelings, like I was being watched and judged. I listened to my gut feelings, and I began to watch my little brothers and cousins more closely. On one occasion, I noticed a strange dog was watching them as they played. Now, my family has quite a few dogs, five at the time. Two pit bull hybrids, one albino, the other brown, a German shepherd, a mixed sheepdog, and finally a dog I didn't know the breed of, but it looked like the other two pit hybrids we had. It was colored a mix of brown and black. However, the dog I saw watching us was a mess of fur and colored a dark brownish color. Its jaw had this overbite. I could see ribs on it, and its back legs looked wrong, like they mismatched. I should mention here that I am Native American. My tribe says if a skinwalker shapeshifts into something, sometimes a part of it comes out wrong. After seeing this dog, I got everyone to go back inside. We would not be playing after dark for as long as I had that feeling. If the feeling went away by the next day, I was going to let my little brothers and cousins play. That night, our dogs got into a fight with something. I listened to them fight it all night. The dogs were vicious. After the fight, I waited until the sun was up. I went right out to investigate. 
The whole yard was a mess. I could see where the fight started and where it went. The sand and bushes where the fight started looked like a dogfight. But as I followed where it progressed, I started to see whatever my dogs were fighting getting bigger and bigger. The aftermath of where the fight ended, it looked like a horse and another horse had fought. The bushes were uprooted, and there was a hole about five inches deep and seven feet wide. I got pale, and I ran to check on my dogs. My dogs only had some scratches and bruises. This is where it gets creepy. Three to four months after this, the two pits died from fighting some cougar. A cougar that decided to come up to our house. The dog that looked like a pit had to be put down, too. It had gotten attacked by a porcupine, and the quills went too deep into the dog's face. The German Shepherd got hit by a car and broke both back legs. My family and I tried to nurse it back to health. We even made some splits and wrapped both legs. Sadly, its legs still got infected, and she passed away. Our sheepdog disappeared, and we later found it dead. It had choked on something it was eating a good 130 yards away from my house. They all fought that skinwalker, and later died in odd ways. My older brother and I buried the dogs where we bury our pets. We placed stones on them to prevent scavengers from digging them up. As we were walking back from burying the last dog, Something weird happened to me. I got really tired all of a sudden, and my vision began to go black. I let my brother know what was going on, and he made me sit down in the direction of the dog's graveyard. My vision went black like I was blind, and I couldn't see at all. My other senses were fine, but my vision was affected. As I waited with my brother, I swear I could hear the dogs we buried barking loudly. As I listened to the dogs, my vision returned to me. We then walked back to the house together. As time passed, my vision deteriorated. I now wear glasses, but I'm glad everything's all over. That thing, whatever it was, I believe it took part of my vision, and it took our dogs. But it did not take my family. I would do anything to protect my family. A warning to you all. Keep good and strong dogs if you live near skinwalkers. And know a good medicine man if you can. Bad Ouija Board Experience From Jack When I was around 10 or 11 years old, I was in primary 7 in school, it was a tradition that all the pupils go to Edinburgh for an end-of-year trip. I had only joined the school about a year prior, and I found it hard to make friends as everyone else had already been friends for years. So I would spend my break time and lunch time on my own. The teachers who were organizing the trip noticed this. They decided to put me into a room with six other boys, probably hoping that I would bond with them. One of the days we were there, we went to a place called the Edinburgh Dungeons. It was basically like a ghost train but without the train. It was pretty cool. At the end of it, there was a gift shop, and they had this basket of wrapped up items behind the counter that were only one pound. We didn't know what was inside it, but everyone was lining up to get a gift since one pound was such a deal. On the way back to where we were staying, everyone was opening them up, and we all soon realized what we had purchased. A do-it-yourself Ouija board kit. It had candles, essential oils, a spell to summon spirits, and directions on how to use everything. On the last night, I had the idea to make the Ouija board. Only two of the boys were up for it, though. The rest were too scared and superstitious, despite acting like they were brave. We went and got what we needed to make our Ouija board, and we began to play. We moved the glass a few times, pretending we didn't do it, but after about 15 minutes, we were almost ready to call it a night, when the glass moved again. This time, we all swore that we hadn't done it. Being young and stupid, we didn't believe each other, 
as we accused one another of moving the glass. I said we should try it each on our own, just to prove it. I was the second person to have only my fingers on the glass. I felt it move on its own, I swear I did. Some other force was moving it. It felt very strange. After we all confirmed that it was none of us pushing the glass, we all put our fingers back on together. One of my friends began to ask questions, such as, Who are you? And how did you die? The spirit told us that he and many other spirits heard us calling out to them. At this point, we were all getting very freaked out, so we decided to stop playing. Around an hour had gone by since we stopped playing with the Ouija board. Everyone in the room had gone to sleep, except for me. I began to hear strange noises around the room, and I thought I kept seeing strange shadowy figures in the corner of the room. I didn't want to stay there, so I went next door into the girls' room, as they were all still awake, and I sat with them. I still don't believe it. From Anonymous. I was maybe 12 years old when I saw it. We had just moved to a new town. I was happy, being able to make new friends and all. I remember sitting at the park, only half a block from my home. It was a bright day, not a cloud in the sky. I was shocked when a kid came up to me. I'd only lived here a few days at that point. The kid's name was Joe. Joe was tall, maybe the age of 16. I asked him what was up, but he just smiled at me. I thought that was weird until he finally spoke. Do you know what happened in your house? I felt uncomfortable then, but I shook my head to answer. He smiled again. Just don't try to be brave. He left after that. I asked around at school about him and the house I was at. Turns out there is a legend, so to speak, that the house I live in was used by a man who summoned a supposed monster. I told my parents, but they laughed and said I was just being silly. I made up my mind that day. I wish I hadn't. That night I decided to climb into the attic. The attic was dark and smelled of death, and dust filled my nose. I turned on the flashlight that I'd brought with me. I scanned the room, but I didn't find anything out of the ordinary. I'd been looking for signs of this man who summoned a monster. I felt rather relieved, having not found anything. I was thinking all of this was just silly. Still, I wanted to know what else was up here. I began to move things around, pushing items aside. I wish I'd just left. A soft hissing sound came from behind me. I thought that one of our cats, which we had two of, had climbed up after me. Still, I felt uneasy. I sighed and told the cat to go back downstairs. In return, I heard a deep laugh, unlike anything that might come from a human. I felt my heart sink for a few moments. I was shaking, too scared then to move, to make a sound. I got the feeling that something wanted me out of there. My breath caught in my throat. A hard, cold hand grabbed onto my shoulder. I wanted to scream, but no sound would leave my lips. A voice, something that sounded more akin to a vampire than a person, spoke in my ear. You don't belong here. I somehow managed to speak, but all I could whimper was, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Leave now. Whatever it was threw me down from the attic. I missed the stand I'd used to climb up, landing instead on the floor. Thankfully, it wasn't that much of a fall. I looked up and I saw something looking down at me. Something with a head that had a sickly gray color to it. Eyes cold and full of hate. Teeth a sickening yellow. All of this just peeking out from the lip of the attic entrance. 
In some places, there was no skin, just bone. Thin black hair hung from the top of its head. I shook uncontrollably looking at it. This thing looked like it was right out of a horror show. I ran to my room, and I didn't sleep a wink that night. I sat up in my bed all night, rocking back and forth, sitting close to my nightlight. I was too scared to move much more than that. After morning came, I busied myself downstairs, not wanting to be on the second floor, not wanting to be near the attic. I told my parents, but they got mad at me that I went up there alone, not believing my story at all. For the next two days, I barely slept at all. Finally, when I did fall asleep, I was awakened by that voice. I told you, you don't belong. I froze, slowly opening my eyes. Eventually, I got out of bed to peer out of my room. I could see the attic door open. Something was hanging out of it a claw-like hand, holding a bloody, dripping bird. I don't recall much after that. I must have screamed or fainted. When I woke up, I was on the couch downstairs. We ended up moving my room downstairs, too. And I never told anyone else about this beyond my parents, until now. My Experience Owning a Demonic Doll From Anonymous Over the summer, I came into contact with a very nice lady online named Mary. Mary had a very interesting item up for sale. A doll. A doll that was supposedly very haunted. I asked about it, and she gave me all the details on it. I was very curious about it still, and also very skeptical. I asked if she knew the original owner. She did, and the original owner's name was apparently Michael. Through her, I was able to contact Michael and have a conversation on Charlie. I'd like to share the doll's story and my own personal experiences with owning a demonic doll. When the original owner, Michael, was three, his parents began to foster children and usually they'd keep them for six months until they found them a good home. But on Michael's ninth birthday, his parents decided to foster Charlie. This was Michael's ninth birthday present. Charlie had AML, which stands for acute myeloid leukemia. Because of this, he was very sick. Michael hated Charlie. He saw Charlie as the reason he didn't get anything else for his birthday. With Charlie having AML, he was not cheap to take care of, and a lot of money had to come out of Michael's parents' pockets in order to keep Charlie healthy. AML affects the bone marrow and white blood cells. It's a form of cancer and affects about 200,000 people every year. The life expectancy of someone with AML is two to five years, sometimes longer with treatment. It can be quite painful causing pain in the bones and extreme back and leg pain. Again, Michael didn't dislike Charlie. He hated him. Michael always said there was something wrong with Charlie. Charlie loved attention. He loved seeing Michael get teed off. Seeing Michael get ignored by his family made Charlie happy. Michael said he always thought Charlie was evil, but no one saw through his charade. They simply thought of him as a poor, sick boy. Weirdly enough, whenever Michael came down with an illness, Charlie seemed to be more energetic and feeling better. And as Charlie stayed with them, Michael seemed to get more and more sick more frequently. When Michael was feeling good and getting attention from his parents, suddenly Charlie would have a flare-up and need attention all day. Other strange things would happen as well. During the time Charlie was with them, they tried buying pets for him. But all of his pets would soon mysteriously die. Charlie never seemed to care about his pets dying. He also didn't care about his AML. According to Michael, Charlie behaved as if his disease was more of a nuisance. Well, something strange did happen. Michael woke up one morning, feeling a dark energy. 
He asked Charlie if he could feel it too, but Charlie said no. It was around then that Michael said that he knew when Charlie was going to die. During Charlie's final months, Charlie began to act happier. During his flare-ups, he would get excited and have energy that he shouldn't have. Everyone put it off as a delusion from his weakened blood flow. The day Charlie died, he and Michael had a talk. He referred to it as the talk because it was the last private conversation he and Charlie had. The day he died, he said everything felt off before it happened. Michael knew it was going to happen and so did Charlie. They discussed if he was scared of dying. They discussed their beliefs about the afterlife and about what Charlie was going to do when he was on the other side. As the conversation came to a close, he told Michael not to worry, stating that he would be back in a few days. Michael was very confused. Later that night, Charlie became very ill. There were doctors rushing in and out with medical equipment. They decided he should pass in his home peacefully. A few hours later, Charlie was gone. After Charlie's passing, Michael said it was like a cloud had cleared and the sun had finally risen. The dark energy that surrounded the house was gone. One night, Michael felt that dark energy again. He followed the sensation to Charlie's room. This had become a sort of storage area now. He said he could feel evil coming from the room. He opened the door and walked in. He went to the shelf of porcelain dolls his mom had collected. He picked up a doll and swears he heard something. Told you I'd be back. It was Charlie's voice. Michael was shocked, throwing the doll across the room. He blacked out then, having terrible dreams until he woke up. After that, he asked if he could go stay with his aunt and uncle for the rest of the summer. He believes that Charlie chose this doll as a vessel because it always creeped Michael out. He'd always been scared of the doll and Charlie knew it. In fact, Charlie would always sneak it into his room at night or he would tell Michael all about the doll and how it talked to him and moved around the room on its own. This is what led him to believe this is why Charlie would choose the doll. Years later, Michael's mother passed away leaving him in possession of three of her dolls. All the foster kids received three porcelain dolls. It just so happened Michael received Charlie as one of the dolls. Nothing happened until a week later. Michael began to have the terrible dreams and began to feel drained. He got sick, and no matter what he did, he wouldn't get better. No matter how much sleep he got, he would still feel tired. That was when he decided that Charlie needed a new home, and eventually, Charlie came into my possession. Michael sold the doll to a collector who gladly took Charlie in. The collector began to experience the same exact things and decided she had taken on too much and had the doll relocated. I soon came across Charlie while scrolling through eBay one night. I decided to message the owner. She tried to convince me not to buy it and explained what I was getting myself into. I didn't believe a word of it, so without hesitation, I purchased Charlie. A week later, I received him. If I could go back in time and undo this, I would in a heartbeat. The moment I opened that box, I felt it. It's hard to explain, but I could feel a change in the air. I picked up the doll and got chills immediately. I put it off as a coincidence, and I brought Charlie into my room, setting it up I told it that it was just a stupid doll. How could it possibly be evil? I had to go to work then, so I closed my door and left. When I got home later that night, I walked in and I could feel it. That weird feeling again. I brushed it away once more as a coincidence. I walked into my room and found Charlie still there, but that feeling was still in the air. The energy it gave off was so powerful. I got in the shower, then I went to bed. That night, I had horrible dreams. I would be somewhere peaceful with family or friends, 
and all of a sudden, they would go away, and this thing would chase me up and down, ripping me apart. I call it thing because no words could describe it. I've never seen anything like it before, and I hope I never do again. Other weird things began happening as well. Lights would flicker or die. Phones would die all of a sudden. My TV and game consoles all of a sudden didn't work anymore. Finally, after three weeks of hell, I had enough. I was dead set on getting Charlie a permanent home away from mine. I did research and found a place to keep Charlie out of harm's way. In my time with Charlie, I can tell you there are some things none of us can explain in this world. I can tell you that demonic and possessed items are not something you ever want to mess with, and they're very real. Whatever Charlie was, I can tell you he sure as heck wasn't normal. And I kind of believe Michael now when he said that he didn't think Charlie was human. I just hope whatever or whoever Charlie is finds peace at last. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's eeriecast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to eeriecast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.